Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of Archaeology After Dark. My guest today is Brianna Henderson. Bree, thanks for being here. Yeah, no problem. I'm happy to do it. So tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, well, I've been working with a CRM firm for a little bit over a year now. Um, but before that, my background is mostly in museum education, uh, primarily aerospace and um. <laughs> primarily aerospace and aerospace history. Well, that's something we have a lot of here in Alabama, especially here in Huntsville with the Space and Rocket Center being something you can see from probably across the state of Alabama. Yeah, that was actually my first job right out of college. Did you, um, uh, did you like working there? I did. You know, it was always really interesting. Um, there are a surprising amount of tourists who come from other countries to see the U.S. Space and Rocket Center. Um, I met people from Germany, France, India. Um, there's also a lot of big international groups who come to do space camp. Not a lot of people know space camp, at least in the pre-COVID times, runs year round. So there's always campers going on. It's not just a summer thing. Yeah, it's everybody's favorite fifth grade field trip is space camp to, you know, go yes. up and down on the space needle, you know, get gravity sickness from going around and around and around and then throwing up in front of their friends because they're like, oh, yeah, I could totally do this longer than you can. That is not a challenge you want to accept in front of your friends that they will make fun of you for the rest of your life. <laughs> you sound like you have some personal experience there. Yeah, yeah, there is some personal experience there. Uh, my fifth grade class may or may not be the reason that certain groups aren't allowed to spend the night at space camp anymore. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> so uh, you told me you worked at the museum in Pearl Harbor, too. Yes, I worked at the Pearl Harbor Aviation Museum on Ford Island. I did that immediately after the Space and Rocket Center. They were looking for a more aerospace based person because they were starting to move into some more astronomy type stuff and so that's kind of the position I moved into in their education department. Did you like Hawaii? I know it's a lot of it has a more flat kind of weather like you know what to expect from the weather there. Yeah you know I really liked it the weather took a little bit to get used to because prior to that I had lived my entire life in Alabama and as you know like the weather changes every five seconds here um, in Hawaii for the most part it was very pretty all the time um, highs in the low 80s very very rarely got under 60 degrees uh, it was very strange around Christmas time for everything to still be green and warm and pretty. Like you'd see the Christmas lights on palm trees. That was very strange to get used to. Um, but it was a super fun museum. I actually got to go with them on their outreach program and teach on Kauai. So I lived on Oahu and did most of my work there. Um, but we had an outreach program called the Barnstorming Program. Um, Hawaii, even though it's multiple islands, it's treated as one state education funding wise. So a lot of the schools can't afford to come to the museum directly. So for free, we would kind of bring the museum to them and spend like the day teaching different classes, um, the science of flight. So on a lot of TV shows like Hawaii Five-0, Magnum PI, stuff like that, they make it seem like travel between the islands isn't that big a deal. Like it's maybe 20 minutes here, 20 minutes there. Is that actually how it is? Yeah, it's not bad at all. Um, I could actually fly from Oahu to Kauai in way less time than it would sometimes take for me to get from the museum five minutes down the street to where I lived because traffic in Hawaii, super crazy. Um, so I lived maybe three miles from where I worked and I got to where I would just bicycle back and forth because it was faster. Um, you could be in traffic for like an hour and a half just waiting, <laughs> whereas I could fly to Kauai in like 40 minutes. Yeah, those of us who have been in traffic in downtown Birmingham know exactly what it's like to be in traffic for an hour, hour and a half, or at Christmas time to actually start a football game in the middle of the street. 
oh no, I actually went to UAB. That's where I got my bachelor's degree. And I can remember one time I was trying to get home after classes. I got off an exit going down to an overpass, was in a traffic jam on the exit, looking down at another traffic jam on the overpass that I was heading towards with no way to stop it. <laughs> I was like, well, I guess I'm just in it now. Yeah, those are the days that it really helps to have a playlist. It doesn't matter if it's a good playlist, just a playlist of any kind. Yes, that's actually a good thing to have in CRM too when you're out in the field, Audible, Spotify. Yeah, um, Rebecca and I were actually talking about that, uh, that a lot of people, you might have noticed this while we were out in the field, a lot of people have a fondness for a podcast of some kind. Usually it's a grisly murder podcast of some kind, yes. but... Like, okay, I'm out here digging holes with a bunch of people and they're listening to stories about murder. I need to probably sleep with at least one eye open around these people. I know that's not really what I want to listen to while I'm outside in a remote area digging in a grid pattern. <laughs> it's like, are we are we studying in case we find somebody out here one day? Like, what's going on? Like, do I need to keep looking over my shoulder and see if somebody's coming up behind me with a shovel or something? Like, Yes, do you know something about being out here that I don't know? No, I usually, if I'm listening to a podcast, um, I'll listen with like one earbud and it's usually a science podcast of some kind, uh, like ologies. Well, yeah, you have to have one earphone in and the other one out so you can hear someone screaming, my God, sign at you for who knows what, just because you're walking in the wrong direction. <laughs> yes, the first couple of months I, I worked with the company that I'm with, I couldn't even listen to anything because my coworkers are such a hoot. Like they were more entertaining than the podcast I was trying to listen to. Yeah, I heard <laughs> scream out, somebody scream out, my God, son, on my first day. I'm like, oh my God, somebody's getting fired already. And we've been out here an hour and a half. Wow. <laughs> I know it took me a little bit sometimes to be able to tell like what was a joke and what was serious because everybody's so excellent at deadpan humor <laughs> it's like are they actually mad at this person what's going on it's fun mad though they're mad because yes. we've been out in the woods for going on three months all together and we have to get through it so <laughs> I know I talk to my friends about what I do for a living and most of them have relatively normal office jobs so like before quarantine they would drive back and forth to an office nine to five hang out for the day um and they'll ask me what did you do today Bree?" and I'm like well I climbed over slash crawled under multiple barbed wire or electric fences today hopped a ravine crossed a creek and I, I play Dungeons and Dragons. And so they're always like, wow, Brie, your job sounds like you live a dungeon crawl. <laughs> well, it's funny you say that because I physically crawled along a fallen tree like a caterpillar once because I didn't have the right boots on and I didn't want water in my shoes. <laughs> I so I just, before. like just right across the tree. Him. I've had to throw my equipment across a ravine before and I always feel bad. One time I looked across the steep ravine, took my screen and like javel and hurled it. And as I did it, um, the person who fixes our screens, I said like a quiet prayer to them. I was like, please forgive me for I have sinned <laughs> like the roof of the screen. Well, the, the best thing about a screen is, and I had never thought about this until somebody actually showed it to me, is you hold it up on your arm like Captain America's shield and you just like push through the forest. It's pretty awesome. It is the best device for destroying briars because, you know, we also swim through briars. It's not all ravine jumping. Sometimes it's a ravine crawl to a briar patch or crossing a creek to more briars. Yeah, there's always more briars. We can't, it, we don't understand how there's always more briars, but there are always more briars. And then once you physically remove them from yourself, they're still there somehow. Oh no, I still have uh, briars in the bottom of my mug boots somehow from projects that were months ago. Like I'll just, the insole will move and I'll find one and I'm like, how are you still here? I still have red clay stains on my backpack from 
March of last year. It does like to stick around. It doesn't come off. You have to have a special process for it and no one really understands what the process is. It's just, no. it's permanent. Just live with it. It's actually adding character to a backpack. Yes, people can tell that backpack is saying things. <laughs> Speaking of, you know, red clay, dirt and all the things like that, uh, working in a museum or just like an office and then shifting to this job where, you know, in an office building, everything is just so neat and clean. And then you get out in the woods and you're like, Oh my God, this is the forest. This is not my nice, clean, this is not my clean, comfortable, safe space of an office. I know when I took this job, I guess, so I'm very tidy at home. I guess my family, despite all of my outdoor hobbies, thought that I was, I didn't like to get dirty. Cause I remember I was telling my grandmother I was like, yeah, you know, I finally got my dream job. I'm going to start working as an archaeological field tech with this uh, CRM firm. And she looked at me and she goes, you know, you have to get dirty, right? And be outside. And I was like, well, I mean, I feel like that was in the job description. <laughs> so I think it'll be okay. <sighs> I will yeah, say. Yeah. yeah, the first weekend I came home to visit my parents, they saw my hands, how they were all cut up and everything. And they're like, Daniel, is this what you signed up for? And I was like, I honestly had no idea what I was signing up for. So it's always a surprise. Yeah, you you never know what you're going to get when you sign up for a project here in Alabama. It could be a nice, smooth, open field, which is fantastic. Or it could be a dense forest that might give you Vietnam flashbacks on occasion. It, it can definitely be like a dungeon crawl. I've actually had a couple of really wild experiences, uh, one of which involved a ravine. So you know how we dig. Like we dig on transects and everybody follows along, but sometimes in the dense forest, it can be really hard to tell which way the transects are going. Yes. So we had caught up with the person who was flagging and I was next up to dig a test. So I start working, had heard people, the other people in the group talking about how to get down into the ravine I was next to. So I thought the transect was gonna go across the ravine and keep going that way. So they disappear into the woods I finished my shovel test. Um, the whole time I had been digging, I could hear barking far away. But, you know, there's always like a neighborhood somewhere out there past the fields and the forest. So I was like, oh, it's probably just a dog. Whatever. So I get done, put my data on my flag, make it down into this ravine, deep ravine, like 10 feet or more deep ravine just covered in sand at the bottom where it floods part of the time and I start walking with my equipment I'm marcoing trying to hear somebody say polo but it's so deep in the ravine nobody can hear me and I hear the barking of this dog it get closer and closer and then it switches from a barking to a low growl and I can't see anything like I'm looking around trying to find this dog and it keeps growling. And I was like, well, if I'm close enough to hear this dog growl, I am close enough probably to get attacked by this dog and I cannot see it. So I adrenaline scramble back up the ravine, kick the bank out from under me on my way because I'm scrambling so fast. And then I get there and realize I left my shovel and screen at the bottom. <laughs> just like I'm like well I'm safe with the dog but I have to go back to get my equipment and I guess I had been gone long enough that people started to get worried because I heard uh, one of my teammates go Brie and I yelled back um I said hey I'm over here but there's a really upset dog and I'm not really sure I can move and you know me I'm pretty it's very hard for me to yell. I'm pretty soft-spoken, but I was trying my best. <laughs> so my coworkers said what they heard was something, something, dog, and then nothing else. And they thought I was petting a dog. And I was like, why would I stop doing what we're supposed to be doing to pet an angry dog? <laughs> I was like, that is not safe. So finally, um, the crew chief caught up to where I was at. 
And I went over to her and I said, hey, I thought everybody went down into the ravine. So I went in there. There's a very upset dog. I accidentally <laughs> left my equipment and I need to go back. So we both go into the ravine together. And I warned her ahead of time. I was like, listen, we're going to get down there. I'm going to sprint, grab my equipment, sprint back, and then we're going to leave. And so she's following along with me. And she's like, I don't really see what you're so worried about. And then the dog starts growling. And she's like, oh, so that's it. And I was like, yes. And I grabbed my stuff. And she was like, I wondered why you said we were going to sprint as we're sprinting away. So I made it out of there only to find out a couple of weeks later when we went back to that area, I had probably stumbled upon a coyote den because we saw like two coyotes in the span of five minutes. <laughs> so I've narrowly escaped being attacked by coyotes. So that was fun. Also been blown at by a buck deer one time. Thought I was gonna get charged by a deer. I was out flagging in this kind of like marshy area. And I heard something blowing. It was warm enough that I thought maybe it was a snake. I was like, have I upset a snake? Is he warning me that he doesn't want me to be here? And then I look up at this hill and make eye contact with this buck with these massive antlers. And he's just going, <sighs> and I was like, please no, not today. <laughs> he decided to go the other way. I was like, <sighs> that is both the joy and the danger of working here in Alabama, you have the wilderness, but at the same time, you have the wilderness. Like it is there. Which I'm really fortunate. I grew up in the woods. So my dad would take me scouting to find where the deer were, or I'd go hiking with my grandpa and he'd quiz me on like, what is this plant? What are these tracks? What does this animal do? So luckily I do have at least a little bit of common sense when it comes to the woods. I just don't always expect there to be a coyote den in the ravine around the corner. Yeah, my first day out there in the field, I was following our flagging person and I just kept like pointing to random stuff to annoy him. I'm like, can I eat this? What about this? I found this on the ground. Can I eat this? Oh, no. and, he's, and he's like, why do you keep asking me this? Did you like hit your head on a tree or something? And I'm like, well, yes, I did. And thank you for asking me about it now. <laughs> Happened a while ago. Glad you noticed. It's like blood. Thank you for <laughs> noticing the concussion I have now. <laughs> and did you, did you just think one of my eyes was naturally smaller than the other? <laughs> hmm. uh, I will say people that are new to CRM, I did not know when I was new to CRM, that everybody gets lost at least once. So my first week when I was brand new, I stopped for five minutes to eat my sandwich. And again, we were in very deep, dense woods. I kept on eating my sandwich, look up, can't see anybody. I go quiet, can't hear anyone. And I'm so new that I have no idea what a transect is. All I know is like, just follow the line of people and get to the next empty flag. Um, so I start walking through these woods, trying to figure out where to go. I see the flagger across the way and my mind is like, okay, well, if he's going that way, if I go the opposite way, logically, I should find the rest of the team. So I keep walking, time passes. My cell phone doesn't have any signal, so I can't call anyone. And I'm, I'm very perfectionistic. So the whole time I'm lost, I'm having like these mental montages of the supervisor being like, well, you're done, you are fired. I cannot believe you just spent all this time wandering around in the woods lost. So I'm like panicking. <laughs> if that was the case, I would have been let go the first day. I wandered in the woods for like an hour and a half on the, first day of the dig and nobody knew which way we were going actually like two of the flagging people were going in the like opposite direction of each other so I'm like okay I'll just follow this person they're going the same place so I mean and I realized you know an hour and a half in I was following the wrong person well I was just trying to hear somebody <laughs> finally got cell service called the person in charge of my team that day and she goes just head east just head east and you'll find us and so I head east 
still freaking out on the inside about like I'm gonna get fired my co-workers probably think I'm just slacking off in the woods and then I come out like half a field away and have to do a walk of shame to the rest of the team and that's when I found out everybody gets lost so if you're new to CRM you get lost in the woods you're not alone apparently it happens to everybody yeah that is one thing it is easy to get confused and lost when people start using fancy words like east and west and directional tracks. And I'm like, what? Just say left or right. It's not that hard. I know. I feel like in this age of like, Google, tell me where to go. Sometimes we don't really think about north, south, east, west. Um, I will say, I think my map skills have definitely gotten a lot better from getting into CRM, especially now that I flag some, definitely have a much better sense of direction. Yeah, I had this professor in undergrad who went out of her way to scold me for not knowing how to use a paper map. Um, I'm hoping she's going to watch this episode and probably remind me that I need to double check my map skills because she does that. I know how to use a map. Thank you. You're such such a wonderful lady. Thank you so much. I've got I know definitely what, improved my uh my map skills. Sometimes when I'm out flagging, I just kind of marvel that I'm actually <laughs> know how to get places. Cause I can remember being a teenager. I took my grandma to a historic Christmas tour of homes because I like the architecture and she loves the decorations. So keep in mind this is probably only like a couple of blocks. It's like in the small little old part of the theater and we parked and I, it took me two hours to get us back to where we parked the car <laughs> oh, and now i tell other people where to go <laughs> flag out stuff but it seems to be going really well yeah the weirdest thing about following people and getting directions out in the woods like if you're they wanted us to be 30 meters apart from each other. At that distance, everybody kind of looks the same. Like everybody's yeah. wearing the same hat or something. I'm like, is that, is that who I'm supposed to be following? And okay, it's snowing now. I can't actually see where I'm going. So I'm just gonna stand right I'm here. My best. I'm just gonna stand right here and not go snow blind. And then somebody threw something at the back of my head. <laughs> I'm like, who does this? What? What? I know. Well, recently when I was flagging, so it's it's been winter time. It's been winter time for a while. It's probably ending soon. But I was having to flag through a wetland because that's where TVA wanted us to go. And my mug boot broke through the ice and a fish swam away. <laughs> I was like, I like looked at the person who was following me and I was like, there is a fish in here. And they were like, what? And I was like, I just scared a fish away. I was like, I get why we're here, but also why are we here? I would have asked, can I eat that? It was is, tiny. Is, is that okay to eat the fish swimming right there? Is that okay? Can I eat that? And they would have been like, yeah, sure. I mean, you want to go right ahead. <laughs> it wouldn't have had a lot on it, but you could have, I suppose. Yeah. So you transition from a, a museum is a very set environment. It's, mm -hmm. you know, nine to five, do this during the day. Very scripted, Te teach this class this way, give this tour this way. Yeah. How did you transition from that to CRM work, which is, the nicest way I can put it is unpredictable. <laughs> so for a little bit in between the CRM and the museum, I took a job at a hospital and that is an entirely different sort of animal. Um, you would think since you're focused on saving lives and doing really important work that there would not be drama, but I guess because there's, you see these people for so many hours a day for so long and it's high stress, there's a lot of drama. So I We've moved all seen Grey's Anatomy, yes. Yes. So I moved around from like department to department trying to find a position where maybe there wasn't that much drama. Finally ended up in the medical lab and most of the people that I worked with in the medical lab 
probably would have had a great time out in the field doing CRM. Um, we had a pathology assistant who was really cool. His office door was really close to my desk because I was the clerk, the assistant, so I did all the busy stuff. And I would look over and see what he was up to and be like, oh my God, are you biopsying, you know, this body part? Is that what I think it is? And he would let me, he would let me watch sometimes what he was doing. Um, I was the second shift person. I want to say like my hospital experience helped prepare me for CRM because you never knew what was going to happen next. Um, <laughs> one night it was after business hours an OR nurse comes in with this huge like biohazard bag and a plastic tub and I was like oh what did you bring me to log in because I had to write down the log and everything and she goes it's a below the knee amputation and I was like oh okay cool I was like let me just log this I'll you know put it in the fridge pathology will be here in the morning and they'll take care of that and I go to pick up the whole tub and the nurse looks at me and she goes no I have to take that bag just the bag so I had to pick up this trash bag essentially full of somebody's leg and then try to fit it in the refrigerator where we kept all of the chemical reagents so that it would stay stable overnight for pathology to come and work on so I'm just over there like shifting it around trying to fit in like leftover Tetris <laughs> so I think after that like I was pretty prepared for CRM <laughs> it was like the some of the like fun quirky chaos without the drama or as many bodily fluids so yeah if I had any job where somebody just handed me somebody's foot I'm gonna be like you know what I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna go I'm gonna uh I'm gonna go rethink the decisions I've made so far I told somebody to that story and they were like, wow, Brie, that's something that you probably only share with medical staff and a handful of serial killers. <laughs> and I'm always... People we work with who love hearing about it. Yes, I know. I feel like CRM is kind of its own little world and I love it. Like, as long as you're not, as long as you're not creepy, weird, any kind of weird seems to be okay like well we all like collect animal bones that we find in the woods <laughs> like going yeah there was one guy he just like found a fox skull in the woods and strapped it to his backpack i'm like okay i guess that's cool kind of not really something i do but hey i mean whatever it's cool if it helps you get through the day it's I mean, pretty interesting we uh i took home a, a turtle shell one time it was mostly sun bleached like the the coloring was gone so that was pretty cool yeah that is something you find a lot here in Alabama turtles will just like leave themselves in the woods so that's something you commonly find here in Alabama turtles weirdly I don't know if migrate is the right word for a turtle but it's kind of what they do yeah they move around you find a lot of turtles a lot of deer I can't, like deer skeletons are probably the ones that I see the most. Yeah, if you find those in the woods, you can't eat that. That's not okay. Don't eat that. <laughs> in certain states, you definitely don't want to. It might have chronic wasting disease, so don't yeah. touch it. Yeah. Although I have seen my man, Matt Sullivan, eat an entire rack of ribs in the field. So it's not, it's not outside of the realm of possibility to just gnaw down on a deer should it hop <laughs> should the need arise <laughs> i mean should lunch just happen to hop past you that's totally cool i mean, I mean it saves it sounds you from like the archaeology gods wanted it to happen so yeah when the stars line up and they give you like a nice day in the field you want to pray to some sort of deity that it continues because here in alabama it is well like today it's been almost 80 the past two days here in huntsville and Today, it was in the 40s, which, yes. you know, I want to curse a groundhog somewhere for not making up its mind. It is very strange. I don't know. I'm always cracking jokes on the rare occasions when I lose tools. I'm like, well, another one for the archaeology gods. 
another sacrifice to them. It's a sacrifice to ensure that the weather maintains, even though the weather never maintains, because this is what Alabama chooses to do to people in archaeology. <laughs> it's true. We like to try to put some kind of control over it, but there's really not any. Um, would like to make some sort of offering to the briar gods, because uh, since you worked with me last, I have developed an unfortunate curse or unfortunate slash fortunate i always almost always get a positive shovel test when i am in a briar patch it's it happened a few times in a row it started off as a joke that brie always finds things in the briars but it's gotten so bad that the crew chiefs don't want to send me into the briars <laughs> <laughs> There was literally like one time we were gonna split up and one team was going into the briars and one team was digging on an AR and they were trying to decide who was gonna go on what team. And then somebody looked at me and they were like, Bree, I think you should go into the briars. And then somebody else was like, did you forget about her curse? We cannot send her in there. She'll find something that for, there's no context for, shouldn't be there. And it's just magically there. It happens every time. <laughs> Well, I mean, it's not, you find some weird stuff here in the woods in Alabama, like, you know, a rusted out car for some reason, that's just there. Six packs of beer, that has weirdly happened that somebody it's, will probably miss at some point, but. It's really strange and often it's things that we want to find. They're just weird isolated finds. Like one time in Mississippi, so there was like a train track, briars, an overpass nothing had been documented being found there i dig my shovel test in the briar and i pull out this beautiful core piece from where somebody was flint napping <laughs> had to square in the briars with like the sun bearing down on me it was in the summer i felt so bad the rest of the team's trying to delineate <laughs> these briar thickets with trains just like zooming by so uh, you had to learn how to do this from, you know, just actual real world experience. How steep was the learning curve for you? Did you pick it up like right away or is it like a horrible adjustment period? I think once I got some more clarification on what exactly was expected, the learning curve was not that steep because I went from, so my bachelor's degree is in history and my minor's in anthropology and I took primarily archaeological based courses for my minor so I did have a field school but my field school was like a bizarre mix of like a phase two and a phase three so we had excavation units but we knew where the boundary of the site was so we weren't having to define that because our site was a a miner's house up uh, near one of the mines in Birmingham so like we knew where it was what we were looking for etc I had no idea what a phase one was like, I, I didn't was... either like I would read a report and I'm like okay this one says phase one this one says phase two I, I don't know what that means I had to look that one up I'm like oh okay I'm gonna pretend that I know the difference now because I, know. I did not know what to expect I got out there and it's a bunch of people like portable screens walking back like cotton fields digging random holes and I was like okay I was like so we're doing the background work like the stuff you don't see on the discovery channel like we're out there trying to find the things that people will later maybe do like a discovery type channel dig on that's how I describe our work to I'm like wait like, this this isn't nice and organized like my professor made it sound this is wrong yeah it was a little bit i had to i learned a lot i feel like um i feel kind of like i was probably a little bit of an idiot looking back i did not know what subsoil was i was like they keep saying sub i don't i don't know what they're talking about i'm just gonna ask people around me what to look for because when i got hired it was for a massive project and there actually were not enough staff. So I didn't get trained at all. Like nobody trained me. 
because there wasn't anybody to train me. So I would just go around to like the most experienced people and be like, so what is sub? How can I tell if it's sub? Like I know how to dig a hole. I know how to measure how deep something is. I just need you to tell me what I'm looking for. Yeah, that is one thing you'll find people get really touchy about in the archaeological community is how well or not well you dig a hole. If you're doing it wrong, people will tell you that this is wrong and you need to fix how you use a shovel. <laughs> I can remember. Um, so I thought I knew how to dig a hole like I can dig, especially now. But when I first started, I was trying to put a lot of like my legs into it. So I would do a lot of like, put the shovel in, stomp on the shovel, try to scoop it out. And I remember on one of my very first projects, the crew chief was like, you're not digging that hole like you want to dig to 70. And I was like, what, what does that mean? And they were like, well, you just have to work long enough to figure out the way your body needs to move to dig properly and I found out it's I guess it's more of like almost a full body thing um instead of having your legs do the work you kind of work together with gravity so I do a lot of like harpooning the soil now <laughs> and it actually yeah, it's like a, a quick in. stab in the soil yeah. and that's the and best then a way to do step it up and a push yeah it works a lot better because I can remember struggling on the first project like 70s holes like took forever and now if the soil's decent it doesn't take hardly any time to dig to 70 so it's a lot of trial and error I guess when you first start in CRM it's probably going to seem like a steep learning curve and you might feel like an idiot but you're going to look back one day and look at all the things that you've learned to do the weirdest thing is you there are some days you never stop feeling like an idiot. Like there are always going to be some people out there who are more experienced or better at it oh, than yeah. you are. And I was like, That's every job. I was like, OK, all these people out here, with the exception of like two other people are way better at this than me. And I need to be OK with that really quickly. Yeah, and it's nice to have more experienced people, too. I like being able to have people that I can annoy with questions. I'll often tell people, you know, this question I'm about to ask you might sound common sense and it might sound kind of dumb, but I would rather ask you a dumb sounding question than ruin something or like make a dumb mistake because I didn't ask you this question. I was half expecting on my first day out there to have to wear like a name tag and like a little tracking beacon so people could find me when I got lost. lost? Luckily, I only got lost the one time and I didn't get fired, luckily. Um, trying to think what else was kind of a learning curve. I guess it, it's not anything that you can't learn. It's more of like a lifestyle you have to get used to especially um if you have a family or like a significant other they're gonna have to be somebody who is cool with you being on the road a lot um I probably spend here lately like 75 percent of time on the road at least luckily my husband's okay with that because he knows this is what I want to do for a living but you know it might be something if you're interested in CRM you want to evaluate a little bit. Yeah, you want to evaluate how committed you are to some of the relationships in your life. Like family, no, I'm, I'm good. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> who, who are these people? I don't need them right now. Let's go. I know. I feel like uh, my family never knows where I am. They're just like, what, what state are you in today? Where are you driving this weekend? <laughs> Yeah, the uh, the entire time I was on that project we worked together on, I left my dog with my parents and I kept reminding myself, okay, my dog is accustomed to a certain lifestyle now and I'm going to have to be okay with that. I know it can be really hard because I'm quality time is definitely my language for how I show that I care about somebody. So I'll have all of these like random thoughts and I'm on the road and like irrational thoughts I'm like what if my cat thinks I don't love her because I'm not at home <laughs> even though my cat probably doesn't have that big of a 
a concept of time like she has a concept of time but it's not the same as ours same with my dog like I could be gone four minutes or four days and it's going to be kind of like the same amount of time to my dog but to me as a human I'm like what if there's <laughs> what if he time? thinks I broke up with him or something what <laughs> how how am I going to fix this okay bribe him ham yeah. lots and lots of ham he likes ham it's like oh look a new squeaky toy <laughs> <laughs> yeah i got my dog a squeaky bottle of what looks like jameson liquor and it looks like he has a drinking problem when he squeaks it that's hilarious and i send those pictures to everyone and they are hilarious <laughs> yeah that's a big thing i guess if you are interested in getting into this line of work um i feel like stationary jobs in crm are pretty rare like you have to get on at like a mound full or you know a big site or a museum of some kind a lot of it is travel-based work it seems like yeah this a lot of people think of archaeology they see it something like indiana jones and it's like that but it's also not like that like he you know has to come and go a lot but he's also not really attached to any one place for a lengthy period of time like you'll go on a dig and it'll be a three or four month project where you'll have to stay in that place for three or four months at a time and realize okay I'm gonna get broken up with probably twice while I'm here I know I feel like I could take up a second residence in Mississippi at this point so like this will be my second home and I'm gonna have to sell it in three months <laughs> I know it's like can I claim residency in Mississippi is that a thing Will I get a tax break? I've been here, so I've contributed to your economy so much. I bought groceries here. I contribute to your economy. Do I get a tax break on it? Yes. Yeah, so that's a big thing. And I guess if you are on the road a lot, you need to be prepared. Like if you're taking your own personal vehicle, I stress about vehicle maintenance all the time, like making sure before I leave that my oil is good to go that my tires are going to be okay um i feel like since you're on the road a lot more you're more statistically likely to have something go wrong so i bought an emergency roadside kit i haven't had to use it but on the off chance that something happens at least i'll be prepared um i don't know and it's a lot of especially now because we are still traveling and the pandemic is still a thing being aware and as safe as you can um i don't explore a lot because i don't want to put the team at risk or their families um and usually we're kind of there's nothing to explore usually um but if there is something to explore after work you know just smart things like wear a mask wash your hands keep hand sanitizer in the vehicle that kind of thing don't go out and do anything stupid after work that could get you exposed don't go to a crowded bar that's not following the rules <laughs> and then spread it to your coworkers. um because we've had several instances where somebody had a potential exposure and then maybe that person came in contact with somebody who was leaving to like go to another crew and then that whole crew has to get tested because maybe that one person might have had the virus. Have uh, procedures or the way they set up these projects, have they changed a lot since COVID happened? Like I imagine it made it a little more difficult to prep for the field since you have to keep, you know, the mask thing in mind, the six feet thing in mind. I mean, the hand, the hand sanitizer is a given when you're out there touching stuff in the woods. Oh, yeah. It's been a, it's a little bit different. Um, we don't ride as closely in work trucks anymore. Um, they typically try not to have more than like three people in a work truck, maybe. Um, and then we wear masks in the work truck now. Um, but not in the field. Not in the field, um, only in very specific oh, instances, yes. like um, like if we're digging around the public or um, last week, I was close to like a steam plant 
so as a courtesy, like we wore a mask that way. None of the employees were like, oh, look at those people without their mask. It's being typhoid Marys over there. <laughs> <laughs> It's just being super aware because I never want to be the reason that somebody gets sick and then spreads it and then it spreads to more people. Um, I'm probably a little bit overly cautious about it because my parents are both nurses. So I go hardcore and I meal prep <laughs> so that I really don't have to go out for food. Um, and then it just helps to eat healthy on the road too. And I bought... Um, I bought all of this gym equipment so that I can work out in my room. That way I don't have to like try to find somewhere to work out or worry about like somebody touched the treadmill and sneezed all over it. And they said they cleaned it, but did they really? <laughs> well, that's the other thing, you know, it's not like a controlled space when you're out there in the field. It's like all sorts of, factors come and go like birds swooping over you or you're if you're like me and you've been out there for an hour and a half and the vulture starts circling I'm like well this is it <laughs> they're coming for me yep. and it's hard to control too when you travel so much because I've been to towns who have they they're great like they're all following their mask mandates you know there's hand sanitizer every time you have to go in like a walmart um and then i go to places where nobody cares like it seems like nobody's paying attention like they look at you weird because you're wearing a mask and doing all the things you're supposed to so that can be i guess that's a a stressor right now like i'm sure it's a stressor for everybody but it's very hard to know that you're doing your absolute best to protect people but you can't control what the general populace around you does at any given time. Yeah, it's really weird when you're out there in the field, you don't realize that what you're doing is actually affecting the community around you. Like people are having to make exceptions for what you're doing, like out there on their land or in the woods or whatever. So they don't, you know, mistakenly have you arrested or something for trespassing. <laughs> yeah that is that is very true and then sometimes um it's kind of like when you're in customer service and somebody gets upset at you for policies that you don't have any control over because you are the face that they see like I've had instances where landowners I'm not TBA um you know TBA just sends a contract to my employer that we fulfill but people see me and I'm the point of reference like the first person they see so I may not have any control over the fact that they're going to build a road through your cotton field but I'm the person who's going to get yelled at because you're upset that there might be a road getting built through your field um, so definitely you know if you're sometimes the areas are really remote but if you're digging around landowners maybe definitely Practice your customer service voice. Get a little zen in there. Be like, it's not me they're mad at. They're just upset about the situation. Like um, this farmer and his shotgun really aren't mad at me. He's mad at the government. Yes, and it can be scary because sometimes, like, you know, we do our best if we are in residential areas to tell the landowners that we're there and what we're doing. But, you know, we live in the South, in rural areas, people have giant yards and there can be like three houses centered around this giant plot of land. And you don't know like who the big chunk of land belongs to. Actually had a really scary situation back during the summer it was flagging and these people's dogs started barking. We were just like in this woods. It was for an access road. So you couldn't really tell who the land belonged to. This dog started barking. An actual dog, not a coyote this time. <laughs> and um, I hear somebody go, hey, what is that? And I didn't know that they were yelling at me. I thought they were yelling at their dog. So I was flagging. And this lady comes out with a pistol. <laughs> oh <my> God. <laughs> and like, she was like, what are y'all doing out here? And I was like, oh my God. I was like, you know, I'm about here doing a survey for TVA, for the power company. Did not mean to scare you. Didn't know this was your land. And like her husband comes out and we're trying to like 
and calm the husband down because they were napping and we scared the crap out of them because they they look they hear their dog barking and look out and just see all these people in their woods and I guess they freaked out it always kind of surprises me when they panic because we wear high vis so I feel like if we were up to something sketchy we wouldn't advertise our existence in the yeah, area we wouldn't want people to see us if we were doing something sketchy <laughs> Yes, but she, we we were talking to the husband the whole time. She's just standing there with her arms crossed, not bothering to hide the fact that she came out with a pistol on us, just like kind of brandishing it loosely, like nonchalantly while they're talking to us. And luckily we calmed the husband down because we told him, you know, we were sorry and that we try to contact people, but that we couldn't tell whose land it was and that TBA is also supposed to notify people, but they don't always do the best job. So basically, we got them to calm down by having a conversation that was pretty much like that darn TBA. <laughs> it's like a sick <laughs> Oh, I'm so sorry for waving my gun at you. It's it's Second Amendment, whatever. It's totally cool. <laughs> it's okay. It always makes an interesting story. Like I got back to the hotel that evening and was on Zoom with my husband, and I was like, so I nearly got shot today. <laughs> and, and he's like, that's for, so cool. Yeah. <laughs> it's actually, I've kind of fortunate because my husband is a meter reader. So he doesn't live the exact CRM experience, but we actually have a lot of unexpected overlap. Like he gets people sometimes that are like, oh, I saw a flash of somebody. They must be creeping around in my yard and they'll come out with a gun and then see his like Decatur Utilities uniform and quickly like try to like put it behind their back like oh I didn't see you out here in my yard I thought somebody was creeping around <laughs> when he gets people people, are, people are touchy about people just showing up at their house whether it's you know an actual purpose or not but that's you know totally understandable I mean you know oh, you got yeah. some weirdo creeping around your house you're gonna be probably a little nervous a little worried it's either <laughs> and then we either get that reaction or like the landowners like okay cool whatever my favorite ones are when we can tell whose land it is and we go to talk to them and all they hear is like power company and they're like oh yeah that's awesome sure do whatever you want I love them and, and it just makes me it cracks me up because it's like the person's like oh I love having electricity please go and do as you will I like having utilities like plumbing and electricity and heat, whatnot. It's so nice. <laughs> but yeah, luckily, um, my husband has some shared experiences. Like, he actually runs into way more angry dogs than I do because he has to go in people's backyards. Um, you never know who's back there and how friendly they may or may not be. He's also accidentally scared people while they were tanning. <laughs> which is something I haven't done in CRM. <laughs> yeah, that's something we don't usually do. If we're out in the middle of a field and we see somebody tanning, that's, so I'd call weird. that, a, I'd call that a red flag, I think. I'd be worried. <laughs> like, are they, are they dead? Are they out here on purpose? What, do we, do we report this to somebody? <laughs> which you do see a lot of weird things that you want to know the backstory of. Um, <laughs> I was on a, transmission line job where you just walk the length of a transmission line you know taking doing your shovel test and whatnot and we came across this burn pile directly underneath two transmission lines and it was a hot burn pile like the the soil around it was actually an excellent example of fired clay from how hot this fire was and the whoever had done this fire they were poking holes in spray paint cans to use as the accelerant to start the fire and this was under like two huge transmission lines and then we got to the end of where we were digging for the day and there was this big sign that was like transmission lines do not have fires or make any sort of structure underneath and I was like I kind of want to be here when the sky's fire goes and messes this up but also at the same time I don't want to see <laughs> and then it makes you wonder too why they like I could you know we see why they need the fire sign 
but the structures part I was like who wakes up and goes you know where I want to put my shed right underneath this transmission line that's where I want to build my house is right here under this transmission line I'm gonna start a fire in my house just despite this sign <laughs> It's like, they're never going to need to do maintenance under this. Oh, it's fine. They'll never update it. It's okay. <laughs> See, a lot of, like, just weird things like that. Um, do you remember all the creepy baby doll heads that were found to a wheeler? Oh, my God. Yes. That was, yes. like... All right, imagine something like an Annabelle type movie, and then you see like the actual head of the doll, and it's like just a pile of them out in the field. It is a really disturbing thing to find out there, and you're like, mm, I have it's to go like, now. I have so many questions. Like, I have questions, but I don't want answers. I want this to not exist. Like, erase it, yeah. erase it. You just find like the weirdest things. It's like, creepy. this is like my third creepy baby doll head of the day. Cool. <laughs> that is another thing when you're doing this kind of work, you have to like semi expect the unexpected. Oh, yeah. You don't know what you're not supposed to expect, but you shouldn't suspect it. Just right. anything wild that could happen. Just like, it's like Murphy's prepared. Law. Everything that can go wrong will, like, you will lose one of your boots in a hole. There will be something in one of your boots. You will get hit in the head with something. You will hit someone else in the head with something. You will get snowed in. You might break your screen because the soil is really dense and hard to get through the screen. Yeah, the soil, the soil here in Alabama is something that we are cursed with. It's definitely interesting. I feel like expect the unexpected and have a sense of humor. Cause like any like even on the worst field day, like when it's just disgusting and rainy and like I've fallen in three creeks or whatever, I just look around and I'm like, well, you know, I could be. I could be checking out groceries or trapped in an office somewhere, but I'm out here with all of these crazy, wonderful people out in the woods away from the general public just doing archaeology. Yeah, that is one thing. When you fall down in the woods and you, I quickly try to compose myself because I don't <laughs> want my coworkers making fun of me because they're like, Haha, that guy fell in a hole. I remember I've fallen into my own shovel test before so like I'll just be so focused on what I'm doing I'll screen put the screen down step backwards to go back to digging my shovel test and just stick my whole leg into the test and fall over but I come from like I've had a lifetime of being clumsy so I just I'm ready for it at some point every project I'm gonna fall whether it's in a shovel test or trying to jump a creek or just walking in general just tripping for no reason so uh i close out every episode this way um say somebody wanted to get started in crm work or museum work or in any kind of historical profession what kind of advice would you give them be as diverse as possible like history and archaeology are both very niche fields um every career that i've gone into i kind of make it a goal to learn as much as possible about everything um so at the space and rocket center i not only did tours and like space camp day camp and field trips but um i also knew how to run g-force and space shot so that I could do extra shifts or if you know it got crazy and they needed an extra person I could just jump in and do the thing or um at the museum in Hawaii I learned how to do you know most of the labs um even the stuff that people didn't want to do that was part of the the education program I was like sign me up you know I'll do it and you know find a way to make it fun but I think it's important to diversify um, especially in such niche fields, you don't want to, you don't want to 
box yourself in, I guess, because you never know when you might need that other experience or when somebody might need you in a different area or something could happen and you might need to change jobs or move. And if you've painted yourself into a corner, it's going to be really hard for you to find another job, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Like, have fun and like specialize if that's what you want to do, but also try to learn as much as you can and be as diverse as you can. Yeah, be, being flexible in this kind of work, especially in, you know, a narrow field like in a museum or in field archaeology or anything like that, flexibility is a great thing to have, not just like emotionally or but physically too, because you will have to do stuff that you normally wouldn't picture yourself doing. Oh, yeah. And it's, I don't know, it's just a good attitude to have. Um, I like to think of myself as a generalist, like the Renaissance man, I guess. Like, it, I don't have one particular thing that that's like my thing. I want to know how to do everything. I want to know why we do it. I want to know the best way to do it. Um, that sort of thing. I don't know. Just keep your mind open. Well, uh, that's going to wrap us up today. Bree, thanks for being here. This has been a lot of fun. Thank you. I hope so. I'm sorry I'm a little bit rambly, but I don't know. I that's tell that's what it's here for. To tell five. So. I mean, that's why I invite people to do the show so I can talk to them and they can talk to me and we can make fun of the people we worked with. <laughs> I can't wait to see Zach's episode. Super pumped. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thanks for being here. You're welcome. Uh, it was a lot of fun. Hopefully you got some coherent material 